I'm Dr. Michael Scott, and I'm the author of Space and Society in the Greek and Roman Worlds, published by Cambridge University Press. I was inspired to write the book because there seemed to me a real need to understand the spaces of the worlds in which the ancients moved. How can we understand history without an understanding of the spaces through which its actors moved and how they thought about represented the spaces that they created and occupied throughout their lives. The spaces I'm talking about are the spaces all around us on a daily basis. In 1943, Winston Churchill said, we shape our buildings and afterwards our buildings shape us. And that's the kind of understanding I'm getting at. In the last 30 years or so, our understanding of space has gone from being a, a static geographical entity to thinking about space as a fluid social construct one that not only reflects, but also articulates our own social behavior. One of which is both physical buildings, but also perceptual, the kinds of spaces we create in our minds. And one which is created through both our writing, our visual and material stuff that we have around us. And in the ancient world, what we talk about is epigraphy, ancient inscriptions on stone. And so this book asks, what use is this reconfigured understanding of space? for the study of ancient history? And to my mind, that's a very simple uh, question and a simple answer, because ancient history and the study of the ancient world is effectively sociology. It's trying to understand what makes the ancient world and the people that populated the ancient world tick. And the book takes a series of five new case studies. So there were, in fact, five new worlds that I got myself into doing the research for this book. Um, and perhaps if I just pick out two, one was a case study of the ancient city of Cyrene, which is in modern-day Libya. And there, whereas uh, Romans are often thought to be sort of quite bludgeoning, non-diplomatic types, what turned out was when the Romans came to take over the city of Cyrene, in actual fact, in the spaces that I was examining, they were very diplomatic, very delicate, uh, even sensitive, one might say, about the way that they engaged with and took over the space. Uh, and the other case study I might bring out is Delos, the island of Delos and the Cycladic Islands, which was an island dedicated to the god uh, Apollo worlds. But then, in the third, first centuries BC, it also became home to a series of foreign divinities from all over the Mediterranean, Egyptian divinities, Syrian divinities. And what the research brought out was while the, the Greeks seemed to think that these were all pretty much the much for muchness of the same, actually, from worshippers of their own, they were very, very different entities. And while the Greeks tended to interact with them as if uh, they, could, they were interchangeable, uh, there were many who came from those parts of the world who kept them distinctly separate. So my interests and research interests are developing, still staying mainly with religion and the spaces of religion within uh, the Greek and Roman worlds, but beginning to think about much more widely the very different types of religious space that the Greeks encountered uh, from uh, what could be uh, almost nothing, a, a sacred grove that had no visible architecture to it whatsoever, all the way up to the most complex and ornate of the international sanctuaries. I'm planning to move on to uh, not so much uh, books, but a series of articles looking at different things that have caught my eye, uh, one of which is, uh, for example, a pair of gravestones that I came across on one of the Cycladic Islands in one of the museums there, which showed uh, two sailors who had drowned, and their picture that they chose to have on their gravestones was of that moment of drowning as they reached out one final time to the ship that was leaving them behind. That's something I want to focus on and try and understand why you would want to choose that as your final image. Are there any areas that, that we need to think about harder in the study of the ancient world? Well, one thing that strikes me is that we need to start uh, understanding and thinking back to the best of our ability given the sources that survive, not the sort of traditional senses uh, that we always focus on, sight for example, but can we get at what the smell of the ancient world was like? How did touch contribute to these things? What was the real perception and experience of places that the ancients had that contributed to their understanding of them and the way that they behaved and interacted with them? But at the same time, and I think this is one of the things that makes this such an exciting subject, every year, every moment, a new discovery could come up. Archaeology is turning up new material all the time that could revolutionise our understanding of a particular place, a particular period, or a particular cultural phenomena. And other projects that are running, like the Oxyrhynchus project, has literally hundreds of thousands of pieces of papyri that have come out of the Egyptian desert that are just sitting, waiting to be deciphered and understood. Projects like that 
mean that we're going to keep on finding and understanding the ancient world in a better way for many, many years to come.